Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Venture Wisdom. My name is Rakesh Bhatia and this is the place we talk everything venture capital and private equity. Today we have come together to speak about a, a, a very pressing topic and uh, extremely important topic which is ESG, Environment, Social and Governance uh, and its, uh, spa its place in the venture capital and private equity industry. To discuss this, today we have Jessica Robinson. Jessica Robinson is a sustainable finance and ESG leader. Uh, until recently, she was working with uh, uh, EY in uh, UAE. Uh, she has worked across continents in this space for over 20 years now. Uh, she has played an important role in climate, ESG and sustainable finance across different bodies that she has been part of. Uh, she, uh, uh, prior to this, has worked with several other large consulting organizations. Alongside, she, she was the head of Asia for United Nations Supported Principles for Responsible Investing, which is UNPRI. She was the uh, CEO and board director of Association for Sustainable and Responsible Investment in Asia. Uh, she also led the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. She has played an active leadership role in Global Sustainable Investment Alliance and the Global Investor Coalition on Climate Change. A lot on climate change, a lot on ESG, uh, and a lot of knowledge that she has otherwise been sharing with the rest of the world through uh, the, the articles, uh, through the columns, and most recently her book uh, on sustainable investing, which is called Financial Feminism, A Woman's Guide to Investing for a Sustainable Future. Very interesting book. You all must have a look at it. Uh, so uh, today, like I said, uh, Jessica Robinson. Thank you so much, Jessica, for taking time to uh, be with us today and addressing this important topic and help us understand how ESG fits into the venture capital and private equity landscape. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, um, uh, Jessica, uh, it's it's a it's a fairly widely used term today ESG right and I sometimes relate it with uh, AI and artificial intelligence and technology world where everybody is using the term but uh, it's it's so so widely used that sometimes the real essence of the term is missed out right so uh, I, I I would like to start with breaking down ESG right between what E is what S is what G is right uh, and then perhaps get into the the true part of our conversation which is looking esg alongside the investing so i uh, would love to hear that breakup of how e s and g are broken up um sure um and i think you know just to to sort of almost set the scene a little bit i think there's been a lot of noise about esg over the years um and i say that as someone who's been in this space for almost 20 years both based in Asia, and now I'm in the Middle East. So I have a fairly global perspective on, on what's been happening. Um, I think the important thing to really reiterate is that ESG and sustainability is really a broad universe, um, and it does mean different things to different people. Um, and in a sense, that's actually been one of the problems with ESG, because it's been so hard to define and then so hard to, to, to actually act on. Um, I think, you know, in terms of investors, it's it's had a long history and um, it's primarily about risk or certainly started out about risk management. Uh, actually, back in back in the apartheid days when investors actually started introducing exclusionary screening for certain certain companies. Um, and I think what we've seen is not only are investors focused on the risk management piece, um, but they're also looking around that sort of access to capital, long-term performance, um, and how this long-term vision is actually impacting on, on corporate performance as well. And I think also obviously the reputation, the brand value, more and more we're seeing uh, whether it's it's consumers, uh, you know, Gen Z or, or alike, prioritizing sustainability in their consumption choices, uh, whether it's to do with competitive competitiveness across the market, uh, loyalty, and then of course investment choices as well. Uh, the sophistication or the understanding around ESG has really, really increased, and I say that particularly in the last couple of years. Um, I, I think we've really seen a lot of uh, investors understand what. ESG actually represents to them and their investment decision making 
as well. Um, when you sort of break down the E and the S and the G, uh, I mean, it, it's it's quite sort of formulaic in that obviously you start with the environment, right? Those are the pieces that sit around climate risk. Um, and I know we'll talk later about regulatory shifts, and we see most of the regulatory shifts actually focus on climate risk per se, um, but also around things like carbon emissions. Companies and actually financial institutions are becoming much more sophisticated in terms of how they now measure the carbon emissions associated with the different activities that are involved in. Um, but then also it's actually then committing to the net zero targets that we're seeing many companies actually, you know, pledge, um, particularly when when you look at what's happened globally on, for example, COP28 last year held actually in, in the UAE, we're seeing governments actually say, look, private sector, you now have to play your very constructive role in these net zero targets. And we want to see full transparency over the next five, 10 and 20 years in terms of your progress. Um, but environment, of course, also includes things around uh, pollution. You've got waste management um, and more and more you've got things a focus on biodiversity. So the protection of nature and natural capital is becoming much more important for a lot of investors as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, 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 the opportunities. So looking at clean technologies, renewable energy, uh, pieces that sit around energy efficiency. So the environment piece of the ES and G is, is, is huge. Um, then, of course, you've got the social. And I think most people will appreciate the social component of ESG tends to be much harder to, to sort of identify and then measure. Uh, the risks that we're talking about are not necessarily easily sort of identified. Um, and then of course you've got to put the KPIs and the metrics around it. So human capital, uh, so looking at, for example, your employees and the human capital that you're developing as, as a company or in the, and in the private sector. You've got a lot of issues in certain markets around labor relations, um, working conditions. Uh, and then, of course, human rights. We've seen a lot that's happened in the last decade around human rights, particularly uh, related to, to child labor, if you're in the in the sort of production industry as well. And then, of course, social impact of environmental policies. So how, how are governments, when they introduce certain climate change policies, for example, how how is that in then infecting local communities, um, sort of the, the broader aspects of, of the climate change agenda? And then finally, governance, which is probably the, the most, uh, most well understood by investors, particularly in the PEVC side. So looking at board diversity, you know, how many women are sitting on boards, but it's not only the, the gender diversity, it's diversity across across all dimensions. Um, business ethics, I know, has been top priority for many years, alongside, obviously, anti-money laundering policies, compensation behaviours, um, and corruption and bribery. Uh, we see a lot, obviously, still on the focus on the corruption and bribery piece, particularly in emerging markets, I think, um, is an important an important area to focus on. So, so that's sort of the, the, the definitional piece. What I do say when I work with clients is, whilst the E, S, and the G is very important, it is it is also critical to really focus on your priorities as an investor. You're not going to go out and, and fix all of the world's problems uh, in one grand sweep, right? It's it's a process, and as an investor, you prioritize what you want to focus on, which always comes back to this piece around having a strategic perspective on ESG. Um, and again, I, I often talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which were published back in uh, 2015. So mm -hmm. these are 17 global goals, um, and they are very much the closest thing we have to a, a global strategy. So when you are an investor, what we're saying with the Sustainable Development Goals is, is this is what the world will look like by 2030, or at least our aspiration and our ambition. So from an investor perspective, you have a trajectory and actually those sustainable development goals give you quite a coherent framework, uh, you know, quite a quite a structured approach to thinking about your ESG priorities. Sure. But that's a, that's a good breakup uh, uh, as an understanding of what ESG is. And I believe um, uh, talking to so many uh, uh, investors across the world, which I'm pretty sure you also face, 
is that uh, perhaps uh, G is the easiest and most well understood part of the ESG. Uh, environment is evolving. Social still remains to be something which people are kind of, if not struggling exactly in lack of the right word, they still don't know how to measure it. Right. And I would be keen to understand um, uh, from you what qualifies as the ESG investment when an investor is starting to look at building ESG in their investment thesis, because everybody's talking about building it into their thesis. Um, uh, what qualifies as, as an ESG investing for them? I mean, there's obviously going to be different ways you want to do this. If, if as an early stage investor, you want to say, right, I want to integrate ESG. Now, the extent to which you do that is very much uh, down to your decision as an investor through your investment committee or whatever, because, you know, it, it partly depends what industry you're in, right? Obviously, there are some industries that can be massively impacted by, for example, climate change. Um, so so I think it's partly going back to the industry and sectoral focus of your investment decisions. Um, I would, I would, as I said, look at SASB um, is, is an interesting framework, which may help you think through at an industry level. Um, and also as well, there are other sort of ESG frameworks to, to think through. And then you have to decide the extent to which you want to, to follow the ESG imperative. So it could say, actually, for our sustainable investment strategies, we just want to look at on an exclusionary basis in the first instance, i.e. we will exclude certain sectors, whether it's like tobacco, whatever, you know, you know what the the sort of most the hot the hot potatoes are. Uh, it could be inclusionary, right? You, we actually want to look at companies, for example, with a clearly defined gender diversity at all levels of employment. Um, you then have sort of ESG integration, which is actually all of our investment teams are going to go through an ESG check and check process um are they actually in every decision looking at the esg components which can be quite formulaic um i know there are lots of uh, investment teams that have done their cfa esg certificates and and the yeah. like um you know that is a i mean that's probably you know you want your esg integration as sort of your bread and butter um, but then you've got thematic investing as well and i think we're seeing a lot more around thematic investing where you know and I, as i mentioned i sit in the middle east we are seeing a lot of funds being set up focused on this transition the, the low carbon transition in the region which is is really around energy how do we move from oil and glass into clean energy uh, it's around things like hydrogen green hydrogen uh clean tech technologies um i've done a lot of work on with investment funds on on actually you know, carbon, like what do we do with carbon in terms of setting up carbon funds? Uh, you know, how do we actually think about, you know, not just producing or reducing emission reductions, but recycling and reusing carbon emissions? Um, so there's a lot of innovation on the thematic fund uh, investment as well. Um, and that is when I sort of come back to the point as you really need to understand your strategic position on ESG before you really start putting it into action. Because without your clear vision, it actually, you, you're not, you may not necessarily be impactful in what you're looking to achieve. Um, I do always encourage investors. So I mentioned the UN PRI. I was actually previously head of Asia for the principles for responsible investment. So I'm a huge advocate because if you, if you look at the PRI's website, it's got a lot of really great information across asset classes, specifically also on P and VC. Um, and it will go through a lot of the definitional piece and actually give you a roadmap on what to think through in terms of your strategic positioning on, on ESG. Um, because I don't think, you know, you don't go from A to, to Z overnight. It, it's very much a journey and it has to tie in with your with A, your teams, do you have the people to do this and do it well? And B, your investors, right? A lot of investors now are requiring certain ESG compliance processes to be in place. We've seen that in the investment mandates uh, for a number of years. So, so I think, you know, as the fund yourself actually saying, well, what are our investors requiring and where does it add value? Because the problem we have here is we don't want to create a whole new industry you know, in the ESG world of ESG compliance, of ESG 
it's actually about embedding it fully into the investment process. And I'm a big fan of actually making sure that all of the investment teams are conversant on ESG. I think it's great to have a, um, a specialized team who really know their stuff um, and they can be sort of the SMEs, the subject matter experts. But I also think all of the investment teams re- need to understand what ESG represents. If you've got a team that really understands ESG, your compliance costs will not be will not be huge because it will be embedded in the decision making process already. Um, and then you you have investment teams who are looking out for these actually really exciting investment trends you know it might be something around water management we're seeing loads of really cool stuff around agritech um you know trying to address the 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 food security issue that comes with climate change um urban farming you know there's so much stuff out there uh that i think from a vcp perspective you know that should be on your radar um because that's that's those are the industries of the future and it kind of comes back to what i said about the next generation of business leaders right it's these early stage companies that are really coming up with the sort of climate technology the sustainability innovation um so it's more than sort of a a cost center actually it's it's sort of value creation um and i know we love these words value what does that mean but i think uh, hopefully, I've given enough flavor of that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, in, in, so, 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 what I what I translate that as is that practically any industry that I'm investing in, regardless of whatever I'm picking, right? Uh, we hmm. can actually build something from ESG into that industry, right? And because it's it's, it's such a broad uh, uh, term by itself and uh, the impact area is so large that even if you pick one small part of it any industry you can you can practically bring it in it's just i think as you rightly said it's more about being educated internally what part of it do you really want to start with and where do you build it into your thesis yeah i i I think absolutely there is no industry no sector no company that's not going to be impacted by this right um, and actually, the one thing I will say is, you know, I'm an environmental economist by background, and I've been in this space for close to 20 years. The tipping point is here, right? And so the leaders of the future are the ones that were probably acting one or two years ago, right? Because what we've seen in the last 12 months is just the beginning. And I'm talking particularly around climate change here uh, because, because it is happening. And actually, the climate change component is not just the E. The S piece is massive. You've got to have mass migration. You're going to have resource scarcity. You know, I mentioned carbon pricing before. You know, this is this is on the table and it's going to go, you know, it's going to have a huge impact on, on manufacturing. Um, so I, I do I do really want to, to emphasize this is not something that's some way down the future. This really is happening today. Sure. Yeah. I, I see that, and we have been seeing that impact uh, and an overlap of E over S over G, right? So we have been seeing how how the uh, water scarcity in certain continents or certain parts of the world has been impacting the the social side of it, right? How the hydrocarbon, the use of hydrocarbon, has been impacting that, and so on. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's pretty evident. But coming back to the point that you said, right? So whether we're talking about the carbon taxes on one side or we're talking about the money laundering anti money laundering practices on the other side between ESG and the governance around it where do you see the compliance and regulatory framework heading uh, from where we are today in in terms of making ESG more main mainstream than just something that we do because we want to do yeah, I think you know the, the caveat being different regulators are moving at different speeds in different markets, but they're all talking to each other. So where we see a lot of advancement, and I, I talk a lot about the EU because they have spent a lot of time focusing on, on this from a regulatory perspective, that's probably what it's going to look like in other regions fairly soon. Um, and I do think from an investment industry it's you need to be ahead of the curve on this because it's better to be prepared (laughs) and invest now than wait until after the effect um i've seen that a little bit you know i was in china for many years um and i I did actually quite a lot of work the regulators there but i've also been here in the middle east and and again 
regulators have a tendency to move very quickly and almost retrofit. So I, I do think it's something to be ahead of the curve. I mean, obviously, disclosure requirements are going to be the big, the big piece. Um, they're almost the easiest piece to start with mandating because it's about transparency, it's about accountability. So it kind of dovetails into your broader regulatory framework. Um, and it's likely to sit across all aspects. So things around carbon emissions, so measuring your scope one, two, and three emissions, and then reporting on that. Um, environmental impact. So actually being very transparent about the environmental impact that that the fund or the investor is having. You know, things like board diversity and human rights, which are probably, you know, more under the G bit, but hopefully have been well, well covered. Um, so disclosures are probably going to lead from the front. But at the same time, we are seeing things around taxonomies and standards. Um, just going back to the EU has, has issued a very extensive taxonomy. And that's really how do you define uh, sustainable ac economic activities you know what are their impacts as well and and that taxonomy is really really key for investors because it clearly defines what you say you may invest in versus what you may not um and actually how you evaluate those investment opportunities i think you know even in the middle east i think taxonomies are going to be issued in due course. Um, and then, of course, you see a lot of regulators focusing on green finance initiatives. Um, so how to mobilise capital towards certain environmental activities or assets or projects. Um, and so regulators have issued either green finance or sustainable finance guidance. Um, and the intention of that is really with regulators initiating that conversational dialogue with financial institutions to say, okay, how do you how do you implement this in your within your financial institution? Um, and then how do we evolve regulation to sit around that? Um, and particularly how do we support the transition to the low carbon economy? So you've also got that market opportunity piece as well. And then finally around enforcement and compliance. Um, we will see regulators set up much more stringent enforcement frameworks for, for ESG. Regulators are really building up teams of experts who know what they're doing. And with that goes the, the sort of compliance frameworks and the enfor enforcement actions that we tend to see from regulators. Um, and I think one of the big things will be around greenwashing. So where we see, and again, back to the EU, a lot of action is being taken on uh, really introducing greenwashing measures. So as an investor, if you're making claims around certain green attributes of your funds or whatever, having in place the data and the disclosure to demonstrate the authenticity that sits around that um, and actually, you know, regulators and society at large are going to be watching investors very closely on this. Um, so that's important. So until now we spoke, and I, I think it's well understood uh, when we talk about ESG, we are always talking about impacting the world at large, right? A positive impact to the world at large from, from the practices that can be adopted under the frameworks that are evolving uh, and will continue to evolve for that matter. Uh, towards the end of our conversation, I'm very keen to understand, uh, not exactly understand, keen to uh, put across to our audience any thought that you have where you say why adopting ESG practices make a good business sense and not just a social sense. I, li I like that. So, so to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I mean, I, like, there's two things to come back to. Just firstly, you know, I talked about the sustainable development goals, about being a global strategy for our future. Like, this is what we want the world to look like. Um, so this is the ambition we have. I think also the point I made around the role of VC and PE, um, you know, being such vital parts of that financial ecosystem, the, the, the first part of the investment chain is really important because you're underwriting, as I said, business leaders of the future. And, and I think as a savvy investor, you're looking to fund innovation, you're looking to accelerate and advance technological solutions that actually address, you know, the biggest problems we face as as, as societies. Um, and it's about, it's about thinking bigger. It's about transforming our economies. It's about actually 
thinking, you know, and this is where investors are successful. They're looking beyond the here and the now. I mean, that's why we pay (laughs) fees and fund managers and the like, right? Um, on the demand side as well, you know, I sit in a in a region in a post COP twenty eight world where I don't speak to any investor or any client who does not have climate or ESG on their agenda in some shape or form, and that's the Middle East, right? That the Middle East was slightly behind the curve. Um, they're actually they've caught up. In fact, they've overtaken on many fronts. So on the de- demand side, I do. I do really, I really think we're going to see, well, you know, as I said, I think mainstream and large institutional investors, the big asset owners, they've all got ESG firmly on their agenda. Um, And again, that's really, that's really important. Um, And I also think, you know, if you sit from a, a perspective where we stand today and sort of looking forward, you really think about what are the opportunities, um, that are that are understood particularly around transition and climate and how do we then incorporate those into the sort of capital allocation decision um the investment decision um and also net zero i mean i touched on net zero briefly before uh this is something that again there's a lot of research out there um you know what what does net zero mean for different sectors for different industries and how do we as an investor play into those trends and identify the opportunities. Um, so I think, you know, looking forward, it, it's not viewing ESG as a compliance challenge. It's viewing ESG as, as an opportunity to expand the investable universe. Um, and it's being, you know, what investors do well. It's managing those risks, but it's identifying those opportunities. And it's about channeling capital, you know, the capital that is scarce towards the the future of the world and the world that we all want, probably not, maybe not you and I, Rakesh, but, but, you know, our our children and their children's children, you know, what their world will look like. Um, And I think, you know, the writing's on the wall. It's it's, it's not going away. And and therefore, it's it's a smart move to really embrace ESG today. Great, great insights, Jessica. Uh, I think a great conversation. Brilliant points, uh, both for the starters and those who are already practicing what it is. Uh, your your experience clearly brought out, uh, or I would say, articulated the points well around the understanding of the ESG. Many people uh, like me who are probably not as well exposed to uh, ESG would find it very valuable. So I, I, I sincerely appreciate your taking time and all the thoughts that you have shared today. Thank you. My pleasure.